Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's telephone town hall meeting. We are live this <coughs> evening with your mayor, Drew Dilkin. The mayor is joined by Ward 6 Councillor Joanne Geniak and Ward 7 Councillor G. Juan Gill. In addition, we are joined by hundreds of residents listening in. To ask a question live this evening, simply press 3 on your phone's keypad. Once again, press 3 to ask a live question at any time. My name is Eric and I'll be the moderator of the town hall tonight. During this live telephone town hall, we encourage you to get involved and to ask a question. Mayor Dilkins, Councillor Geniak, and Councillor Gill chose this format as this is an interactive town hall with you, which means they want to hear from you. The mayor and the councillors have made it a priority to engage and connect with you and fellow residents to hear your concerns and answer your questions. Our intention is to get as many questions from you as possible. You can ask a live question at any time by pressing 3 on your phone's keypad. Someone will take your name and place you in the question queue. Now we're still having new people join us and I want to welcome you to tonight's telephone town hall meeting. <coughs> we are live this evening with your mayor, Drew Dilkins. The mayor is joined by Ward 6 Councillor Joanne Geniak and Ward 7 Councillor G. Juan Gill. In addition, we are joined by hundreds of residents listening in. We do want to remind everyone joining us, you can ask a live question by pressing 3 on your phone's keypad. Now at this time, I'm going to introduce Mayor Drew Dilkins so he can open up the town hall. Mayor Dilkins, welcome. With COVID-19 preventing the ability to connect with residents in person, tonight's town hall provides the ability to connect with residents virtually regarding any questions that they have and to address any issues residents have that impact their ward and families. Currently, we have quite a few people joining us, Mayor, so please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Eric, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. It's my pleasure to reach out to you into the comfort of your own home uh, for the first ever telephone town hall for Ward 6 and 7, and I'm so delighted tonight to have Councillor Joanne Geniak with us uh, and the new Ward Councillor in Ward 7, uh, G1 Gill. Thank you both for being here and for adapting because of COVID. Our usual Ward meetings have been up upended a little bit, but we found a way to connect with you in the comfort of your own home, and we're happy to do that tonight. And, and Councillor Gill, I'd certainly like to take a minute to uh, recognize him and congratulate him on his win and welcome him to Windsor City Council, and thank you for jumping right in with the session here tonight to connect with everyone in Ward 6 and Ward 7. And folks, it's no doubt that this has been an extraordinary and a challenging year. Of course, the global pandemic, we're still dealing with the effects of that. Uh, in addition, as that was happening, we had exceptionally high water levels, especially in Ward 6 and 7, uh, that were of high concern to all of us on Windsor City Council. And these trying times have absolutely proven to me that Windsor is an exceptionally compassionate and resilient community. And you know, throughout this pandemic, I have been so inspired by how residents have come together to support friends and neighbors and families and businesses. And I want to thank all of you listening tonight for doing your part to keep each other safe and, of course, reducing the spread of the coronavirus. Windsor has done a great job complying with the public health guidelines, and our numbers show it, and we're doing it because you are following the rules, and I sincerely appreciate it. And, you know, we have done so many things uh, to help everyone through this, including opening the Isolation and Recovery Center, to help get the contagion under control with our uh, temporary foreign workers that are here, eight to 10,000 who are here, and thankfully those efforts are working. Uh, we've also helped support residents and businesses throughout the pandemic by collecting PPE and offering property tax relief, repurposing the WFCU Center and 80 Knox and other facilities, frankly, for the distribution, uh, to act as distribution centers and depots for local food banks. We've handed out literally tens of thousands of bottles a free hand sanitizer. We've teamed up with local philanthropists to donate grocery gift cards to those in need. We've waived fees for parks and parklets and our small business action plan, all sorts of fees and cutting red tape and fast tracking permits for sidewalk cafes and parklets, really to help businesses create safe, accessible, open spaces for patrons. And of course, we supported the temporary street closures for all the BIAs who asked for it in record time. And despite the unprecedented challenges we face, we also carried out large-scale projects to further improve our quality of life. And for those who live in Ward 6 and 7, you know the sewer issue has been a big one for a number of years. And Council recently approved the $4.9 billion sewer master plan to address basement and overland flooding. And if you're listening from Ward 6 right now, the work has already started thanks to money City Council has set aside that we were able to leverage through the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund uh, with our friends at the federal government. And that work is underway and, and we're waiting for the next application to come in and, and hopefully success on that. Uh, we should find out in very short order. And when that happens, we will have a full $175 million of work 
underway in Ward 6 and it's N7, and it's just an incredible uh, start to this huge plan, this $4.9 billion plan. We have also cleared major legal hurdles related to our planned new acute care hospital site on County Road 42. And I can tell you that every single mayor in Essex County has voiced their support. Councillor Geniak has been extremely supportive. Councillor Gill, very supportive in his campaign. And I'll tell you, Premier Doug Ford has vowed to make funding our new hospital his number one priority. And throughout the city, we've completed a number of major road reconstruction works, including rebuilding large sections of Huron Church. You see the work happening on EC Row Expressway, uh, redesigning the intersections at Northwood and, and Dominion, and that much needed underpass under Dougal Avenue and the train tracks at CN Rail. We got that done. But let's take it a little closer to home in Ward 6. And this has been a productive year for parks, rec, and culture and facility projects in Ward 6. I can tell you that much. We invested $1.2 million for the complete reconstruction of the existing washroom building at Riverside Baseball Park uh, to make the washrooms and change rooms more accessible. We spent an additional $355,000 at Riverside Baseball Park for construction of a new parking lot. Parks is currently preparing the RFP for the redesign of our iconic Peace Fountain with a consultant preparing the design options for a virtual public consultation this fall. For those of you who know Tranby, Tranby Park and Tranby, Tranby Avenue also got a lot of attention this year with $3.65 million worth of investment. $300,000 was utilized for the installation of the new wetland-themed playground at Tranby Park. Meanwhile, Tranby Avenue from Parkview to Isabel Place was reconstructed with stormwater detention features, low-impact developments that will really help area flooding concerns. And these features include a, a dry pond and storage facilities under the parking lot and under the road. Also, a multi-use trail was installed in the park and along the road, and so many other great projects and reconstruction and sidewalk projects, Belle Isle View from Wyandotte to St. Rose and St. Rose to Edgar and Matthew Brady from Tranby to the cul-de-sac. We also, folks, we provided approximately 30,000 sandbags to property owners in Ward 6 and 7 over the course of the year as a precaution against overland flooding as we continue to invest in our sewer master plan. And Ward 7, Ward 7 got great investments as well, $100,000 to install new wayfinding signage throughout the Little River Trail for EMS, $321,000 for a new multi-use trail installed along Little River Road in the parkland, $2.5 million, one of our gems in the city of Windsor, $2.5 million for Pesh Island erosion mitigation. That project is currently underway. $250,000 to build off-road uh, bike tracks and a new pump track in Little River Corridor. $750,000 for a new splash pad and washrooms at Forest Glade scheduled to open in late spring or early summer of 2021. And a ton of work going on, especially on Banwell Road. And I know that's important to so many folks. You will see a lot of work happening there uh, for the next little while. And it's going to be great when it's done. There's con the construction includes new concrete sidewalks and multi-use trail flexible roadway pavement, installation of street lighting and traffic signals, upgrading the storm, sewer and drainage, and closing most of the roadside ditches uh, in the stretch that we're doing as well. And I could keep going on and on because this list is so long, but I really wanna turn it over to the councillors to introduce themselves and get right to your questions. So uh, I'll turn it over to Councillor Geniak. Uh, Joanne, thanks very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for um, your opening statements because you certainly covered um, all of the wonderful things that are happening in Old Riverside. I'm um, pleased to be here tonight and want to thank everybody that will be joining us. It's a different, it's a different uh, way to communicate. We're accustomed to our ward meetings where we generally meet at the WFCU Center and have the opportunity to uh, listen to your concerns and share some of the things that are going on in the ward. Um, but I think um, because I've had the opportunity to listen uh, to the other councillors' uh, virtual town hall meetings, um, I'm pleasantly surprised by the number of people who are participating, who are getting their answers uh, to questions that they have either immediately or we get back to them. So I'm going to keep my remarks short. Hopefully can get uh, through uh, a good number of the, your questions. And again, um, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Also, I want to congratulate uh, my new colleague on council, uh, Councillor Gill. It's a pleasure to be with him tonight and uh, to turn it over to him now. Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Geniak. Uh, it is my pleasure to be talking to the residents about uh, New Way. Uh, due to the virtual um, uh, or pandemic time and uh, love to hear from their concerns. Uh, I have chance to listen to their concern. A lot of them 
I met at the door and hopefully like new ones are, uh, I can get the concern and trying to find the solution for that in my term and uh, uh, go ahead and uh, whatever your concern are, you can try to come up and thank you everyone for joining us uh, tonight uh, through the town hall by telephone. Well, thank you very much, Councillor Gill, and we'll turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Mayor. We actually have our first live question coming up, but quickly, we're going to do a survey question. For everyone joining us, you can use your touchtone phone to indicate your response. We want to know, to what extent do you agree with the following statement? Speeding and loud vehicle noise needs to be addressed in our ward through traffic calming and stronger police enforcement. If you strongly agree, press 1. If you somewhat agree, press 2. If you somewhat disagree, press 3. If you strongly disagree, press 4. And if you don't know or don't have enough information to respond, press 5. So again, to what extent do you agree with the following statement? Speeding and loud vehicle noise needs to be addressed in our ward through traffic calming and stronger police enforcement. If you strongly agree, press 1. If you somewhat agree, press 2. If you somewhat disagree, press 3. If you strongly disagree, press 4. And if you don't know or do not have enough information to respond, press 5. We have our first live question coming up from Krista, and it's a question for the whole panel. Krista, welcome. You're joining us live. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, it's in regards to the bus system. Um, I start work at 630, and it's about the Crosstown 2. Um, I was just wondering if there was any way where the buses could start earlier and more frequently and when that would happen. Well, I can take a, a, a short whack at this, Krista. Uh, certainly, I know that our transit system has been um, impacted uh, significantly through uh, because of COVID. And we've heard of a number of challenges. I know um, that we're doing the best that we can in talking uh, with uh, Mr. Delmore. He's definitely saying that they're monitoring uh, the situation continually, looking at adding uh, services as needed. Um, it, it, in regard to the Crosstown 2 specifically, um, certainly I can uh, communicate uh, with Transit Windsor tomorrow and find out um, if there is a possibility of getting uh, service earlier. Um, but I do know that ridership is down. Um, it's been down significantly since the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic. Of course, uh, the transit system was operating at no cost and the revenues have been significantly impacted. So um, I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you if you have further information on this. I, be, I believe we begin um, charging fares again on the 19th, right. and, yeah, um, and and then we feel our way through it, right? Yeah, that's that's right, Joanne. And, and certainly this has been, and I appreciate the the question, and I, I appreciate how difficult this is. And like everything with COVID, the response is somehow imperfect. Uh, for everybody. So we're, we're working our way through this in a, a reasonable and sensible, uh, taking a reasonable and sensible approach. And as Councillor Geniak said, fares have been free since really the start of the pandemic. Uh, and of course, those costs are picked up by all taxpayers. And so the fares will start being collected again on October the 19th. And we plan on operating on the schedule that we have until the end of the year. And at the peak, at the beginning of the pandemic, ridership was down over 90% uh, from what we used to, used to seeing. Uh, and now it's down about 60%. So there's still more than half the folks who used to take the bus, the bus have not come back. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, the, the, the numbers just aren't there. And so we're trying to find a way to offer the service, uh, but also balance that with the expense of offering the service so that we don't dig ourselves further in the hole uh, by the end of the year, recognizing that we're trying to really fill a very uh, expensive hole at this particular point in the operating budget. And so I get it doesn't satisfy everyone perfectly. I'm sorry for that. I wish I had a better solution for you and just say we're going to get back to the service that we used to have on March the 1st. Uh, but we just we, we're not in a position to do that right now. And certainly the ridership is not there to support uh, that type of service. So I apologize that we're we're not going to see uh, uh, perfection in terms of what people were used to having, uh, but we really are doing our best trying to meet the needs of the majority. 
while balancing the uh, the expense and the cost so that we're not uh, digging ourselves a deep hole. Eric? Thank you very much, Krista, for that question. A quick reminder to everyone joining us, if you have a live question you would like to ask, we do want to hear from you. You can press 3 on your phone's keypad at any time, and someone will take your name and place you in the question queue. Up next, we have Peter, who has a question for the whole panel. Peter, welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I live on uh, Jefferson Boulevard in the Joanne Geniac's uh, uh, riding. Uh, as you know, that uh, between Jefferson and Wyandotte, Wyandotte and uh, Tecumseh Road, the traffic there is uh, just uh, overwhelming. Uh, you can get 30, 40 cars at one time. And uh, when it comes to the stoplight there on Tecumseh Road and, uh, and Jefferson there, there's usually a jam up and such. And we're getting a lot more traffic uh, on Wyandotte Street. It's all, it's all due to... Uh, the buildup of uh, homes and that in the town of Tecumseh. Is there any plans? Uh, I don't know actually what plans you could come up with. Uh, you only have Riverside and Wyandotte Street that would kind of flow towards Tecumseh to uh, to better control the uh, the traffic uh, or uh, some other route that might be available other than Jefferson, because we're we're picked we're picked versus Lozon Parkway and and Lozon Road because it's an easier rundown. We don't have as many stoplights, so they kind of use Jefferson Boulevard as a as a run to uh, to the the Cumsey Road, so I'm just wondering if there's any any thoughts at all on that. Well, we're certainly. Uh, I thank you for the question, Peter. And certainly, the, as you, as you mentioned, uh, traffic is picking up um, in our in our ward um, and across the city. Uh, Jefferson has always been um, one of our main thoroughfares, going north and south along with, uh, with as you mentioned, uh, Lozon Road and, and Lozon Parkway. Um, but we, when we extended Wyandotte Street um, going east-west, um, it, it, was, um, it was a move towards alleviating some of the, uh, the traffic on Riverside Drive. Now, if you're heading uh, north-south, again, if you're coming from uh, Decumsey, you're probably going to utilize Lozon and, and Lozon Parkway to head uh, to head south. Um, the traffic that will uh, use Jefferson going north south are generally generated from um, the Riverside area with people moving up to uh, Decumsey Road. Um, I haven't uh, heard anything uh, from engineering, so our, our chief uh, and city engineer. Uh, Mr. Winterton, in regard to um, uh, directing attention towards Jefferson in regard to uh, looking at changes. But I know what you're talking about at uh, Decumsey Road and, and Jefferson. And just a little bit to the north where um, we, we uh, go to um, um, hospice. There's always there are always issues uh, if people are turning uh, west to go to the hospice. So um, as far as as I know, there's nothing we can um, I, I can certainly explore uh, the section from the um, from the Via Rail tracks heading north because that's where my ward starts. Um, and ask Mr. Winterton if there's any considered, uh, you know, from North National um, up to Wyandotte Street. But I thank you for the question. Eric? Peter, thank you very much for that question. Up next, we have another live question coming up from Kirk. Kirk, welcome. You're joining us live. You have a question for the whole panel. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Yesterday, I sent an email to Councillor Gill with a CC to Councillor Geniac and also the mayor. This has been a uh, bone of contention of mine for a number of years. For the last 30 years, the east end of the city uh, has been at the tail end of the garbage and recycle pickup schedule. I suggested a number of years ago that every five years we change that schedule by one day. Currently, we have garbage on Thursday, recycle on Friday, except as in the case of this week, our garbage now is Friday, recycle on Saturday. If we happen to be out of town this weekend, then we either put out our, gar our recycle pails on Saturday only to have them blow down the street over the weekend, 
or advertise that we're out of town for the weekend. So in this month, we would only have one recycle pickup if we happen to miss it. What I'm suggesting is that we have the same opportunity as South Windsor and West Windsor to have an opportunity to have possibly a Monday, Tuesday pickups or even a Tuesday, Wednesday pickups or something other than the current situation. I think it would be fair to everybody across the city if, as in my suggestion, once every five years, we adjust the schedule by one day. The city sends out a collection calendar, so even though it might result in a missed pickup or garbage fails being put out on the wrong day initially, people would soon uh, learn what it was supposed to be. But I would like to see us have the same opportunity as the people at the other end of uh, town. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Kerika. I think uh, I got your email too. Thanks for. Uh, I'm looking into that one. See what we can do about that, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk to the uh, waste management and uh, the administration. Uh, so, like, if there is a possibility of changing uh, a day uh, to all the Windsor residents or, or two different wards, if that is a possible way of uh, doing it, uh, and uh, we can. Certainly look into that one and see what kind of solution we can come up with and we can keep you up posted updated on that one Kirk, thank you very much for that question up next we have uh, Sandra who's joining us now for Councillor Geniac uh, a question Sandra welcome Hello Hello, hi, hi Sandra. Sandra. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. My question is um, I go to the WFC normally for the uh, seniors pool classes. Now, right now, I realize the pools are open. However, the changing rooms aren't. Do they have any idea when in the future if they will go back to uh, the changing rooms? Because it means um, it's very difficult. Like for me, for example, I ride handy transit. You'd have to get they want us to just get like put our clothes on a, on the pool deck. You can't really change, right? You just put your clothes over your wet bathing suit. It's not very practical. I just wondered if they had any idea when the changing rooms would become available again. Sandra, uh, it's Joanne. Thanks for taking the time to call tonight. Um, I, I know that uh, the practices at the pools, uh, the two pools that we do have open, have been significantly impacted uh, to make sure that we're protecting people um, with regard to, to COVID infection. And so the challenges are, are many. Um, I, I will check to see um, when we are going to um, open those change rooms again. But it, it, it's a continual process of monitoring, uh, checking with the local uh, health unit, um, in regard to uh, making sure that the services that we are offering, which are down significantly, I'm, I understand that uh, usage of our pools is is um, is just about at 40% of what we we generally see, and so um, we're 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 monitoring it on a weekly basis. But I, I will check and um, and let you know um, when those when those change rooms are going to be open. Thank you for calling. Eric? Sandra, thank you again for that question. We have another live question. A quick reminder to everyone joining us to uh, press 3 on your phone's keypad if you would like to ask a live question. We're going to go to Joy with a question for the panel. Joy, welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my concern is about the stormwater um, on Riverside Drive. I live on one of the roads that's perpendicular, and so I was a little bit concerned when a fire truck got stuck at Riverside Drive. The water was so high. Um, I'm wondering if the city of Windsor has explored rain gardens as one of the ways of, uh, of cutting down on some of the storm water. I know they're doing it in London. To what extent, I'm not sure, but they are doing it there. 
Joy, thanks uh, for the question. It's Joanne. Um, certainly, uh, the flooding that we experienced uh, in the three major floods was un unbelievable, but I remember the fire truck getting stuck uh, in the very vivid picture that appeared on the front page of the Windsor Star. Um, we're uh, just wrapping up our uh, sewer master plan. Uh, the EA will be coming to Council, I believe, uh, being tabled in November for the 30-day review. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, we will be incorporating a number of, of, of projects um, across the city. You're very well aware of the subsidy programs that we've been offering, I'm sure. And for those that are listening who aren't, um, the city is still offering um, a subsidies for uh, backwater valves, uh, sump pumps for um, downspout disconnects. And um, in his opening, the mayor mentioned uh, Tranby Park coming to completion. Um, Joy, if you have an opportunity to visit uh, Tranby, you'll see a number of um, of projects uh, that have been identified through the sewer master plan um, as ways to ad address uh, flooding through swaling, uh, rain gardens, et cetera. So yes, we're definitely looking at rain gardens um, and encouraging people um, to incorporate those into their property, especially for backyard flooding. Now, when we're talking about storm um, surges, uh, where we see that huge volume of rain which overtakes our streets, and, and when the fire truck got stuck, that was, uh, you know, that was our, our major uh, storm that we had, uh, where the water just overpowered our sewer system. It was as simple as that. It's, um, it, it was uh, unbelievable and the damage was incredible. As we go along with the VISTA project and the, um, and the mayor's uh, disaster uh, mitigation plan, we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars as we move forward. So um, these things definitely are gonna be communicated uh, to uh, the broader public, not just, not, not just those in, in Riverside or East Riverside, um, but uh, flooding has been experienced across the city. And so as the mayor said, it's, it's a massive undertaking of uh, unprecedented dollars that will be going uh, towards upgrading our sewers and our pumping capacity. Um, but small things like rain gardens can make a huge difference if, um, if the community really buys into it. So I thank you for your question, and you're gonna see communications on things like rain gardens coming out um, more forcefully probably um, in the spring. Eric? Joy, thank you very much for that question. Up next, we have another survey question we're going to do. So everyone, you can use your touchtone phone to indicate your response. We want to know, to what extent do you agree with the following statement? Flood risk is being managed appropriately through the proposed flood mitigation projects and city grant programs. If you strongly agree, press one. If you somewhat agree, press two. If you somewhat disagree, press three. If you strongly disagree, press 4, and if you don't know or do not have enough information to respond, press 5. So again, to what extent do you agree with the following statement? Flood risk is being managed appropriately through the proposed flood mitigation projects and city grant programs. If you strongly agree, press 1. If you somewhat agree, press 2. If you somewhat disagree, press 3. If you strongly disagree, press 4. And if you don't know or do not have enough information to respond, press 5. Up next, we have a question from Wendy, and it's a question for the mayor. Wendy, welcome. You're joining us live. Thank you. Yes, Mayor Dilkins, uh, you mentioned something about property tax relief was given. What was that about? Yeah, thanks for calling, Wendy. So uh, this is the first time that we are aware of in the city's history because of the pandemic. Uh, council voted unanimously to waive the payment of property taxes to defer the payment of property taxes for 90 days without penalty and interest. Uh, and so we recognized that people were sent home, that employers were scrambling 
uh, in terms of what to do and whether they, they needed employees and some were just waiting for their CERB checks. Uh, and it was a very difficult time. So city council said, how can we help? And they came forward and they said, you don't have to pay your property taxes for the next 90 days. Now that period has expired. There was no penalty and in interest for the folks who paid uh, by the deadline. And I'm happy to report the vast majority of people did. We we're very, very pleasantly surprised at that. Uh, but in terms of the city, you, you can appreciate that that is our really our only source of revenue. Uh, and so by saying you don't have to pay for 90 days, that has a material impact uh, in terms of operations. But because of our prudent financial planning and the way we've managed our budget over the last 15 years, we were in a position to be able to offer that without really any pain uh, on the city budget and to the taxpayer. Uh, and so that's what I was talking about. And uh, so many people took advantage of that. Uh, we were happy to offer that. And we were one of the few cities that was able to offer that. Wendy, thank you very much for that question. Again, a quick reminder to everyone joining us that if you have a live question you'd like to ask, you can press three on your phone's keypad. Up next is Margaret with a question for Councillor Gill. Margaret, welcome. Hi. Uh, hello, Councillor Gill. Uh, nice to speak with you. I uh, have concerns about traffic. Uh, uh, basically East End, Lozon and Tecumseh, uh, Tecumseh and Roseville, Lozon and Edgar, Loz or Tecumseh and Forest Glade. Uh, just endless accidents, uh, people getting hit. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have any traffic calming measures planned. And also for the old stretch of Lozon uh, between McHugh and Tecumseh Road, uh, just consistently uh, kids on skateboards, people in wheelchairs that are regularly traversing that, and there's no sidewalk, uh, and is there any plan for that? Thank you, Margaret, for your question. Uh, I know like uh, when I talk to a lot of uh, residents, uh, the uh, safety measures are first uh, concern to the residents, uh, like uh, as I'm uh, just uh, taken over um, and I'm looking into that um, uh, uh, section, trying to see what are the best solution we can find out. I know that these uh, roads are having uh, bigger traffic issues and a lot of uh, speedings are uh, concerning. And there is also another uh, speeding um, uh, Myers. They are coming up uh, in the council in next month or so. And we can see what the recommendations are based on that recommendation. We can try to work towards uh, uh, keeping uh, the slowdown of uh, some of the traffic uh, in the speed side and also improvement of the roads. Uh, that is also the initiative uh, can make it uh, more uh, feasible and safer for the communities to go through the, that road. Uh, and uh, hopefully, like uh, as uh, time goes on, we can come up with uh, some kind of a solution to the, uh, these. Uh, this is a concern to a lot of residents and uh, we have to play a role in that one to see that how we can also assist us and that way we can uh, implement some of the uh, norms to slow down these and make the improvement and make a um, lifestyle safer and communities are safer in that uh, neighborhood. Thanks. Margaret, thank you again for that question. Up next, we have another live question. Quickly again, if you have a live question you would like to ask, you can press three on your phone's keypad. Someone will take your name and place you in the question queue. Up next, we have Pat with a question for Councillor Geniak. Pat, welcome. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, my wife and I have lived uh, on the 200 block of Reedmere in Old Riverside for more than 46 years now, and we've had a history of flooding problems. Now, I can say without question that the situation is much better today than it ever has been, but one more drop would probably be uh, too much for us. So the question is, can we nail down more specifically when the VISTA project will affect the area uh, which covers my street between Lausanne and Pilet Road? Thanks for the question, Pat. Um, definitely, uh, as I have acknowledged and, uh, in the past and, and tonight, uh, Riverside has, uh, has uh, traditionally uh, 
really been whacked by flooding, um, not only concern with the increase in the, um, the rain events, but we were also um, impacted with the rising water levels um, in the lakes and, and the rivers. So definitely um, the VISTA Stage 2, uh, which will go from St. Rose to Ford, is going to make a difference. Um, that project is, is going to come in at around $39 million and um, the, uh, the timing uh, is as follows. We'll begin the utility, um, it's a massive project, you know that Pat. Um, certainly uh, the utility work where we have to move all of the poles and the services uh, will begin in 22 and 23 and the physical construction will uh, begin in 2023 and be completed in 2024. Um, that is going to include um, uh, underground, of course, uh, trunk, trunk lines, storage sewer, sewers, uh, barrier landform, and the road work. Um, so in addition to that, in addition to the VISTA project, we're looking at the, the DMAF um, overall budgets, um, and that will incorporate increasing the pumping uh, capacity both at Ford, uh, St. Rose, um, enhancing the St. Paul pumping station. I, I can't express um, enough that this is just massive undertakings, and so the engineering takes time, the utilities take time, and I really feel for all of us. And I say all of us because I get the flooding too. Um, I have residents who have had uh, their insurance canceled, um, which is heartbreaking. Um, and so we're moving as quickly as we can. Uh, but that's the timeline as of today. The sewer master plan impacted um, uh, how we're going to be able to proceed because a lot of the sewer master plan uh, EA, which we're going to be um, tabling on November 23rd for the 30-day review, is uh, going to be incorporated in the VISTA project. So I know it can't come quickly enough. Um, I'm a lifetime resident of, of Riverside, and uh, as were my parents and my grandparents. Um, so I know we need relief. Uh, the mayor continues to champion uh, this cause um, in the most aggressive way. Uh, we did tap into the first pull of the disaster mitigation funding that came um, from the feds. Uh, we were very appreciative of it. Um, and got 31, uh, $32.1 million. Um, the second pull on DMAF projects across Canada went out, and unfortunately, uh, we, we weren't awarded anything in that, um, which was really disappointing. And, and we, need, we need our partners and our, our local partners to really start advocating because there is now a third opportunity, and it's critical for us to get this money um, to be able to undertake all of the, uh, all of the sewer projects um, that we need to address within the city. Um, in his opening remarks, um, the mayor made a reference to uh, the $4.9 billion sewer master plan, which, um, which goes beyond, certainly beyond Riverside. Uh, and I've heard him r refer to uh, the number of sewers in the city. Um, if you laid them down in a straight line, it would extend from Windsor all the way to Orlando, Florida. So that gives you some idea of, uh, of what we're looking at. But certainly in the Riverside area, I've, um, I've shared those dates with you. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see it starting tomorrow. But when you're engineering projects like this, it takes time. Thank you so much for taking uh, uh, the opportunity to call in tonight, Pat, and I hope that answers your question. If not, uh, don't hesitate to give me a call at the office, 519-945-4434. Thank you. Amen.
and Pat, let me just jump in to add to that. We understand, uh, and and I appreciate what Councillor Juniak just said. We have a full appreciation, understanding how difficult the flooding situation is in Ward Six and parts of Ward Seven, uh, and we know that Vista is the answer, uh, at least the, the full works of Vista, including the sewer parts, uh, is a, a part of the solution to reduce uh, further flooding in that area. And so, because you're so close to Jefferson and East Lawn. Uh, and being on Reedmere, uh, Joanne is absolutely correct that that money is already in the budget. It's just a matter of waiting for it to move forward to a time when we can activate it. Uh, but the pre-works are already happening. So what we need to do uh, for part of the VISTA project is to expropriate uh, the areas that we don't currently own to be able to, to do the works. Uh, it's something that we do basically on Cabana Road or the other parts of the VISTA project or any road project uh, that we do. There's, there's some element of expropriation when we're doing this type of work. Uh, and the quantum is huge, uh, and you should know that, but you have no better advocate uh, in your corner than Joanne Geniak, and she has been working very, very hard uh, as of I to try and get this money to pull it forward as quickly as possible to get this work done, and I can assure you, uh, although it seems like 2024 is a long time away, and, and it is, uh, when you have these high-intensity rainstorms, it seems to be happening every year. Uh, we are on this. This sewer master plan is very important to us, and the all of the resources that we are uh, putting into the sewer master plan, uh, they all started in Riverside. They all started in Ward 6 and Ward 7. Uh, we're doing some works on Cabana Road. We're going to oversize as well, uh, which fits the sewer master plan. Uh, but you are the initial beneficiaries of this plan because we know the magnitude of the problem that you've experienced over a number of years out there, and we want that to end. And although uh, Joanne and I can't take credit for 125 years of you know the sewers being put under our feet, uh, and the installation of those over that period of time, uh, we can start uh, pivoting and making the changes that are required to make sure that our community is resilient uh, and prepared for the effects of climate change that we see happening that I don't think our forefathers could have predicted 125 years ago, but they're here now. Uh, and so we've got the plan. Uh, the plan has been approved unanimously by City Council, and we are activating and working on that plan with the utmost diligence. In fact, it is, it is a you know, one of the top two priorities in the entire city, the hospital and the sewer master plan, those two are at the very top of the agenda. Eric? Pat, thank you again for that question. Up next, we have another live question coming up from Frita. This is going to be for Councillor Gill. Frita, welcome. You're joining us live. Hi. Uh, my question is, will there be other plans for a light to be installed at Little River and Banwell? I'd like to cross Banwell um, uh, from Little River because I, I walk on the Blue Heron Trail. There's a four-way stop there now, but the, with cars coming from four directions, some of them turning, I don't feel safe crossing. Okay, thanks, Frida. I know that um, I talked to a lot of residents about uh, Little River and that area. A lot of concerns about the crossing because uh, there is a walkway on the uh, one side of the street and then there's the residents coming uh, crossing uh, and this is a uh, busy and there is a lot of um, traffic on Little River sometimes it makes a, a complication and also makes it um, you cannot understand like what the person are willing to do. I think we are going to look into that. What are the other options that we can put it through? Uh, through the um, uh, city planning and uh, the safety um, uh, department, and we do, uh, need to uh, do a study, and based on that study, like something for for the safety of the residents, we will uh, uh, work towards to bring something uh, so that everyone feels safer in that neighborhood. And Frida, let me just add, uh, council, let me add to what Councillor Gill just said. Uh, all of the requests, whether it's a, a four-way stop, whether it's a signalized intersection, we have standards for the whole city. So we would simply go out and take traffic counts. And if the tra traffic volume warranted the installation of either of those features, I know there's already a four-way stop there, but anywhere else, we would also we would take the traffic counts, and we would we would simply it would simply happen if the traffic counts uh, met uh, the warrant study. Uh, and so, but there are other tools uh, at disposal. Uh, and I look forward to working with Councillor Gill to look at whether we could put in a, uh, a lighted uh, crosswalk 
uh, in that area as well so that there is more direction to drivers that there's actually someone crossing at that particular intersection because I having driven that many many times I can appreciate how difficult that intersection is uh, if you're trying to cross and, and it's multiple lanes of traffic and everyone of course nowadays is in a hurry uh, and so I, I appreciate the frustration and the concern you have for your safety and I, I certainly will work with Councillor Gill uh, to look to see whether we can actually install a, a crosswalk a signalized crosswalk uh, at that location as well. Frita, thank you very much for that question. We're going to do another survey question. Everyone, you can use your touchtone phone to indicate your response on the following question. COVID-19 has impacted municipal budgets, creating deficits and revenue shortfalls. As the City of Windsor prepares for the 2021 municipal budget, what is most important to you and your family? If it is continued investment in public works, such as road repairs, sewers, and flood mitigation, press 1. If it is keeping tax increases low, press 2. If it is expanding recreation and culture programs, press 3. If it is supporting local businesses, press 4. And if you don't know or are unsure, press 5. So again, COVID-19 has impacted municipal budgets, creating deficits and revenue shortfalls. As the City of Windsor prepares for the 2021 Municipal Budget, what is the most important to you and your family? If it is continued investment in public works, such as road repairs, sewers, and flood mitigation, press 1. If it is keeping tax increases low, press 2. If it is expanding recreation and culture programs, press 3. If it is supporting local businesses, press 4. And if you don't know or are unsure, press 5. Up next, we have Elver with a question for Councillor Geniak. Elver, welcome. You're live on the line. Please go ahead. Yes, good evening, everyone, um, and thank you for taking my question, everyone. This uh, deals with probably a bit of redundancy because I am an avid cyclist, and I live on Ford Boulevard, and uh, we are fortunate in Windsor to have one of the most beautiful bike paths uh, in the city. I, I go often from Ford all the way to the bridge, and from my uh, place on Ford all the way into Tecumseh using the Ganacho Trail. The difficulty is the safety involved from Strabane to St. Rose, where cyclists are literally taking their lives in their hand if they cycle on the street. And sometimes we are forced to use the sidewalks. Uh, my question is, is there anything that council can look into uh, to provide more safety for cycling from those two points that I mentioned? Well, thanks for the question, uh, Alver. And uh, you've pointed out uh, something that we're dealing with um, uh, right now and we've been, been looking at since uh, the original bump pit plan came out in 1991. And that's how to, uh, to connect uh, the east uh, side of the city um, with bike plans uh, and, and close that gap be between the Ganacho Trail uh, that ends at Isabel, literally. So um, the, the bump came out in 1991 and kind of had um, an idea of where uh, the, uh, the bike paths were needed. Uh, certainly, uh, when I was first elected to council, it wasn't short. It was shortly after that um, I came on in 2003. Uh, that we undertook uh, the VISTA Project EA, um, which was a, a, a very in-depth look at Riverside Drive and the need to incorporate the, uh, the bike lanes there. So as the VISTA Project um, continues in phases, those bike lanes will, will be incorporated. Uh, in addition to that, um, we undertook um, the active transportation study in 2017 because we really hadn't looked at um, uh, the bump since 1991 and um, we knew that there were these huge holes. So uh, discussion on the Wyandotte Street component, uh, which was the original bump uh, recommendation uh, to include uh, bike lanes there, um, was reviewed and as a result of that you've heard um, that we're looking at uh, that section between uh, Walker Road and, um, and uh, Frank Avenue. 
uh, on Wyandot Street where you see um, the, the lane changes. It goes from four lanes down to two lanes and we move through um, two BIA areas and uh, primarily residential uh, neighborhoods. Uh, so how um, to move forward and incorporate some of the recommendations of the active transportation study um, are being looked at. Um, I'm sure that you, uh, you know, you read in the paper and heard on the media uh, that I was advocating uh, for the narrowing of Wyandotte, and um, I heard from a lot of people. I heard from a lot of people that said, are you crazy? Uh, we don't want to narrow Wyandotte Street because uh, you're going to cut into the time it takes for me to commute to work. And so um, I want to assure you uh, that we will be having a public meeting uh, to discuss uh, this issue, uh, probably uh, coming up uh, in November. It, again, we're probably going to have to have a virtual meeting um, because I don't think we'll be exiting uh, COVID that quickly. Uh, but we will be having a meeting uh, to discuss uh, opportunities uh, that administration has been looking at to try to incorporate um, safe routes for cyclists uh, which are growing in number here in Windsor. I, I hope that answers your question, Alver. If not, give me a call at the office, 519-945-4434, or joageniac at citywindsor.ca. And um, I'll be happy to sit with you um, and discuss some of the things that I've been um, talking uh, to administration about and um, the, the uh, Windsor Cycle Group, um, be happy to do that. Elver, thank you very much for that question. Up next, we're going to go to a question from Bill, and it's for the mayor. Bill, welcome. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, Mayor. Hey, Bill. How are you tonight? Good. How are anyway, you? Anyway, uh, what I, my big concern is uh, the... Uh, the progress uh, being made toward the construction of a new hospital on the on the on that the site that, that everybody recommends so far, except there is a small group that keeps there. They keep uh, they're 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 always uh, they're always they, they want to appeal. They appeal. They I think they had three appeals so far. Is that correct? That that were turned down. Am I close yeah, there? They yeah, you're pretty close. They they appealed the decision of the local planning appeal tribunal, uh, and they appealed that to divisional court, and they lost they lost at the council, they lost at the local planning appeal tribunal, and they lost at divisional court. Is how many appeals are they allowed? Is there a limit there? Yeah. So, Bill, they, the 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 camp group actually has the ability now to appeal. Uh, a decision uh, of a single judge of the divisional court, which is the, what they received, but an extremely well-written decision. They can ask for an appeal uh, to a three-judge panel of the divisional court, uh, and you know that would be their next step. And ironically, you're asking this question, and today was the day that we actually received a notice of motion that has been put forward by CAMP that they intend to uh, put a motion to the court asking for a waiver of the timeline because they're out of time. There, there, there are time limits set in the rules uh, of the court for which they have to make this application and they fail to meet the deadline. So they're at least a week overdue, if not more. Uh, and they're asking to be able to waive that timeline to now ask for an appeal to a three judge panel. And so it's uh, Bill. I'm sorry. I think they released you on the call here. You're back in the in the in the queue. But it is very very frustrating. And folks, let me just say, uh, you know, Pat talked about the the Vista project, and that is a very much of a flooding issue, very much a top priority, as is the hospital. And we have been around the block on this for a number of years, uh, and you, you know, we have been very very patient. And I think you have been very very patient. And I think there is no better time to talk about the hospital than in the middle of a global pandemic uh, and the need for good health care facilities. And everyone who's on the line today, all of your taxes 
not your property taxes, but all the taxes you pay in income tax to the federal government, the provincial government, uh, those go up to 401 to Ottawa and to Toronto. And guess what? You are paying for great health care in other communities through those taxes. And it's time that we get the same great health care here. And so in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, David Mushi and his team at Windsor Regional Hospital, the staff there, do a great job. But I almost think it's unfair to them, and it's certainly unfair to you, that in the middle of a global pandemic, they actually have rooms at Hotel Du Grace Healthcare on a let where there is a ward room with five people in a room and the bathroom is down the hall. And in the middle of a global pandemic, if we haven't learned anything, it's about separation and distance. Uh, and so the new hospital program, the new plan that has been talked about for a number of years, the vast majority of rooms in that hospital are private rooms intentionally made to be private rooms for your privacy, but also for your health and, and well-being, to be able to recover without having to worry about others on the other side of the curtain and what they may or may not have and infecting you. Uh, and so we are fighting, and Councillor Geniac is fighting day and night, Councillor Gill and his campaign, and in my conversations with him, extremely supportive of seeing the new hospital built on County Road 42 at the site that was selected for which there was a, an extremely robust uh, deliberation and evaluation of properties to come to that site. And now I respect that the, the group in the community that wishes to fight that site uh, has legal options available to them. And certainly there are cost consequences for them to seek these legal remedies. Uh, in fact, when they're their last appeal, they're having to pay the city quite a hefty sum uh, because they, they lost uh, their appeal. Uh, and at the end of the day, I get that it doesn't matter what site was chosen, there would be a group in the community that thought it should be somewhere else. But downtown is taken care of in this plan. There are better mental health facilities at the TAFOR campus at the old Windsor Western Hospital. And all of us on the line will have the opportunity to have great health care here in Windsor, Essex. And it's worth stating to all of us on the phone that this is a regional hospital. Uh, and so we had to find a location in the region, in Windsor, Essex, where we could all get behind it. And the site on County Road 42 was a site the city could get behind. It was a site the county could get behind, recognizing that with any new healthcare construction in Ontario, the municipalities that are the beneficiaries, beneficiaries of that construction must contribute 10% of the cost of that capital construction. So in the city of Windsor, this project is estimated to be $2 billion. So we are already collecting, Windsor and Essex County collecting $200 million uh, to help offset our share of the cost for better health care here. And folks, I'll tell you, when I look at the future of this community, if I just look out the next decade, and I look at the fact that we have one of the largest infrastructure projects in Canada happening in our backyard right now with the construction of the Gordie Hill Bridge, which is going to hire 2,500 people between now and 2025 when it opens, about a $5 billion construction project uh, that will in itself create great opportunities in Windsor-Essex. When I look at the conclusion of that project, what we're trying to do is time as closely as we can a $2 billion hospital project on the tail end of that that will hire 1,100 people and take three years to construct and will have great health care for the residents in Windsor-Essex. And so with those two projects alone, and then all of your house prices, your home prices are going up. There is huge construction in the city of Windsor, the likes of which we've never seen in our history, certainly in my life. 48 years in the, in, in the city of Windsor. We've not seen this uh, type of construction and development. There is a decade of prosperity in front of us, and I want to make sure that you, your friends, your family, your neighbors, my kids, your kids, all can benefit and have an opportunity to stay here and enjoy the quality of life that we enjoy uh, in Windsor, Essex, which is why we are fighting so hard to make sure that we get traction uh, with Premier Ford and the provincial government to see this project move forward. Uh, and we're going to do it. Councillor Geniac is behind it. Most members of City Council are behind it. They want to see this happen. And uh, we're excited about this, and we're not going to stop fighting until we get this project over the finish line. And it's going to take all of us arm in arm together uh, because we don't have a rep uh, in government at the provincial level. So please visit our website, Windsor Essex Can't Wait, Windsor Essex Can't Wait .ca, to register your support for this project. Eric? Bill, thank you very much for that question. We're going to do another survey question on this topic, and you can use your uh, touchstone phone to indicate your response. When thinking about healthcare services for our region regarding a new hospital, please select one of the following options. 
If you support the construction of a new modern hospital at the proposed site on County Road 42, press 1. If you didn't support the location a few years ago, but now think we should just get on with it and build it on County Road 42, press 2. If you oppose the site selected on County Road 42, press 3. And if you don't know or are unsure, press 4. So again, when thinking about healthcare services for our region regarding a new hospital, please select one of the following options. If you support the construction of a new modern hospital at the proposed site on County Road 42, press 1. If you didn't support the location a few years ago, but now think we should just get on with it and build it on County Road 42, press 2. If you oppose the site selected on County Road 42, press 3. And if you don't know or are unsure, press 4. Now, uh, Mayor, actually, we're just about reaching the end of the town hall, uh, councillors as well. Uh, with the last couple of minutes, we have some time for some closing remarks that you can share with everyone listening. Councillor Gill, we'll start with yourself. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining uh, tonight uh, through the telephone to uh, raise your concerns. Uh, I am uh, just elected uh, one week uh, uh, ago, and I am talked to a lot of uh, residents uh, to their concerns, and hopefully, like I'm trying to work on that uh, direction. You can reach me anytime at uh, my office number at 519-946-1111. Or you can email me at jgill at citywinter.ca. And I love to hear from you. And hopefully, like, we can work together to find a solution for the issues uh, affecting Ward 7 to make that uh, ward and the city more healthier lifestyle and safer community at all. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Councillor Gill. And Councillor Geniak, any closing remarks? Thank you, Eric. Yes, um, this has been fun. It's it's different, uh, but it's a it's a kind of a fun way to deal with some of the questions that uh, residents have uh, in our wards. I want to uh, thank everyone if possible. Um, I'm a technologically uh, challenged person. I don't know how this happened, um, but I know it takes a lot of work. So I want to thank all those that were involved. Um, thank um, Councillor Gill and uh, the mayor for uh, participating t tonight. Thanks, Councillor Geniak. And Mayor Dilkins, any closing remarks? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Eric, and thank you to Councillor Geniak and Councillor Gill as well. It was an excellent overview of some of the most pressing concerns uh, in Ward 6 and 7. And thanks to all of you who are listening. I know, you know, we're used to getting together at our community centers or arenas and actually being face-to-face -to, -face to have these discussions. But thank you for adjusting and adapting, as we all have for the last seven months during COVID, to, uh, to try and deal with and keep everyone safe. Uh, and allow everyone to participate. So we have lots of great ideas tonight, lots of great conversation. Thank you uh, for keeping your friends and your family and your neighbors safe. The numbers show it, folks, and I, I can't be more proud uh, to be your mayor, to serve as your mayor when I see those numbers. And, and I can tell you, I, I don't know, you know, I said to Joanne <laughs> a couple weeks ago, I said, you know, I'm not sure if it's a blessing or a curse, but I'm the mayor who's had a tornado, the worst flood in the city's history, and now a global pandemic. And I can tell you, each of them were bad in their own, in their own way. But nothing, uh, nothing stands uh, in the way of the pandemic to show the courage, the resilience, and the community support uh, that the pandemic has brought out amongst our community. It's incredible to see, to see how people have supported one another, they've helped one another, friends and family, neighbors, strangers. I, I just, I can't even tell you all of the stories that I've been informed about, and I am so proud to see our community stand together during a very, very, very difficult time that guess what? We will get over this. We will do it together. We will be back in face, uh, in person, face to face at some time, hopefully in the near future in 2021, having these board meetings. And you know, I, I will tell you when COVID-19 first began, we started a campaign with Tourism Windsor Essex called YQG Stand Strong. And the campaign was all about reminding people about we, what we love about this particular region. And I can tell you for me, very, very easy to say it's the care and concern that we really have for each other and the resiliency and the strength of our community. We've got a great future here, folks. There's so many great things happening despite the pandemic. Uh, and I wanna thank you all for playing your part and for being uh, great residents in the community and for joining today and bringing the conversation uh, forward and, and having some great dialogue. And again, all of us are available 
If you just go to Google and you type in our names in City of Windsor, our contact information will come up. I'm happy to answer any emails, as is Councillor Geniak or Councillor Gill, or phone calls. The numbers and email addresses are there. Quick search on Google. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Stay well, stay safe, be kind to one another. Eric, back to you. Thank you again, Mayor, and thank you again, Councillors. And for everyone still joining us, if you have any questions or feedback on today's Telephone Town Hall, I just want to remind you, you can also share them with Mayor Dilkins and the Councillors by email at mayoro at citywindsor.ca or 311 at citywindsor.ca. Again, please email your questions and feedback to mayoro at citywindsor.ca or 311 at citywindsor.ca. Thank you again for uh, everyone. Thank you again to everyone for joining us this evening and take care.